Hello everyone and thanks for watching Edupedia World videos. This is the second video for the topic of capacitors and the stuff in this video might seem somewhat familiar to you because we've seen similar stuff in previous classes in 9th and 10th with regards to current electricity and Ohm's law. So there are two rules which I'll use in this lecture and both the rules you've seen before and we'll see again in current electricity in more detail but we'll use them a little bit right now so I'll explain them a little bit. The first is called Kirchhoff's current law it's also called KCL for short and it says that the sum of all currents directed towards a point equals the sum of all currents directed away from the point. This basically means that in a, in a circuit, charge should not be accumulating anywhere. If this is a junction of five wires this has a current I1 going in this has a current I2 going in this has a current I3 coming out I4 coming out and I5 going in let's say then I1 plus I2 plus I5 has to be equal to I4 plus I3 the current going into the point into this junction is equal to the current coming out of this junction the second law which I'm sure you've seen before also is Kirchhoff's voltage law and it's called KVL for short and it says that the algebraic sum algebraic just means you have to take both positive and negative signs into account of all the potential differences along a closed loop is zero. This basically comes from the fact that potentials are only defined for conservative forces. So if you go along in a circuit, let's say this is a resistance, this is a capacitance, this is a battery. And if you start from here and add up all the potential differences and you reach back here, the sum should be zero because every point has a specific potential. So if this potential is five, then if you add three, then you add two, then you add four, then you have to subtract the appropriate amount in the end so that you can get 5 again. right? So we'll use somewhat similar laws to these right now when we're dealing with capacitance and we'll again start with something which you're probably a little bit familiar with that is series and parallel connections. The only difference is you've seen and we'll see again series and parallel connections for resistors now we are doing it for capacitors. So let's look at series connections first. In series connections, you have a lot of capacitors which are connected in series. Let's say these are all connected to a battery. These should be flat lines, I apologize for my drawing. But let's say this is the case. Let's say this has a capacitance of C1, this has a capacitance of C2, this has a capacitance of C3. This battery has a potential difference of V. Again, one thing which I always like to do is I always like to assume the negative potential of one particular battery as zero and you can decide all the others accordingly. So if the potential difference here is zero, then the potential here, if the potential there is zero, then the potential here has to be V. We don't know the potential at these two points, but we know that this is zero and this is V. Let's call these V1 and V2. Right. Now, what we need to do is we need to calculate the charges given by this bat uh, battery. Let's say the charge is Q 
and we would need to find out the equivalent capacitance that means a single capacitance we can replace this system with that would absorb the same amount of charge Q. That is what it means to say find the equivalent capacitance of this system. We could replace this system by a single capacitance of a, of a particular value and it would absorb the same amount of charge and ultimately give all the same behaviors. So if charge Q is flowing from this place then this place has a charge Q. If charge Q is flowing into this terminal of the battery then this plate has a charge minus Q. Right. Now the moment a charge plus Q is initiated here something very special happens and we need to look at that in a little bit more detail. So these plates are actually not plates they have some thickness and they have two surfaces. So let's say these are the two plates. Right. Now I give a charge Q to the first plate. Now what I'll do is I'll create a Gaussian surface like this. Right. Now what happens in this case is the flux, the electric field is in this direction. Right. In the horizontal direction I mean. So the flux through the curved surface will be zero and the flux through the flat surfaces will be zero as well because these flat surfaces are actually within the material of the conductor. And we saw in a previous video that within the material of the conductor electric field is always zero. So the flux through this Gaussian loop is zero. That means the charge enclosed in this Gaussian loop has to be zero. Right. Now if plus Q charge exists here then a minus Q charge has to exist here for the total charge to be zero. Right. That is the only option. So the moment we have a plus Q charge on the left side of the plate on this plate we have a minus Q charge. Now consider this particular system. This is just two plates connected by a wire. There is no battery here. There is no source of charge. So the net charge within this system has to be constant. So if this plate has a charge of minus Q, this plate has to have a charge of plus Q. Again by a similar logic, if this plate has a charge plus Q, the opposite plate will have a charge of minus Q. If this plate has a charge minus Q and this hole is an isolated system which does not have any battery, then to conserve charge, this has to have a charge of plus Q and this again has a charge of minus Q. So this is really what happens when we connect many capacitors in series. They all end up having an equal amount of charge but the potential difference across them is different. So what we can do is we can write equations for all three. So in the first case the equation will be V minus V2 is equal to Q by C1. Right. The second equation will be V2 minus V1 is equal to Q by C2. And the third equation will be V1 minus 0 will be Q by C3. I have not done anything except apply C is equal to Q by V across all three capacitors. But my unknowns are V1 and V2. I don't know that nor do I want to know that. So what I'll do is I'll add all three equations and ultimately what I get is V is equal to because V2 and V2 will cancel V1 and V1 will cancel. V is equal to Q times 1 by C1 plus 1 by C2 plus 1 by C3. Right. But the actual equation we needed was V is equal to Q by C or C is equal to Q by V. So we see that for the series case 1 by C equivalent is equal to 1 by C1 plus 1 by C2 plus 1 by C3. Right. Also remember what happens in series. In series V adds up. Q is the same and right now I'd like to start to begin an analogy with series and parallel resistances as well even though we'll see that again later. So in series connection in resistors we have R equivalent is equal to R1 plus R2 plus R3. Here we have 1 by C equivalent is equal to 1 by C1 plus 1 by C2 plus 1 by C3. We'll come back to this again in a moment but another thing you need to know is that the two equations are Q is equal to CV or in other words V is equal to Q by C and V is equal to IR. Right. So when we are talking about resistances we use V is equal to IR and when we are talking about capacitances we use V is equal to Q by C. Now what happens in series connections the potential difference across each of the uh, capacitors adds up and the charge across each capacitor is the same. What happens in parallel connections this is a parallel connection. I'm sure you've seen this for resistors as well. 
and all three of these are connected by a battery. So in a parallel connection, the potential difference across all of them is the same, right? So V is the same thing in both cases. So what I need you to see is that R is not analogous to C. R is sort of analogous to 1 by C in these equations. Q is just like current, right? Q is basically current per unit time. If charge is conserved, so is current, right? So V is the same, Q is the same. R is doing the role of 1 by C. So we know that for series in resistances, we have R equivalent is equal to R1 plus R2 plus R3. Whereas for the case of capacitance, it's the inverse. It's 1 by C equivalent is equal to 1 by C1 plus 1 by C2 plus 1 by C3 because C is just like 1 by R. Remember these two things. In series, V adds up and in parallel cases, V is the same. Right. So what is for parallel cases resistances? The equation is 1 by R equivalent is equal to 1 by R1 plus 1 by R2 plus 1 by R3. So from that, we can deduce that if we were to take capacitors in parallel, then 1 by R would behave like C and the equation would be C equivalent is equal to C1 plus C2 plus C3. And we'll prove that in a minute that it indeed, it, in, in, it indeed is true. So resistances and capacitors have the inverse relations in series and parallel. In series, resistors behave like R equivalent is equal to R1 plus R2 plus R3, but capacitors behave like that in parallel. In series, capacitors behave like 1 by C equivalent is equal to 1 by C1 plus 1 by C2 plus 1 by C3. In parallel, this is the way resistors behave. Right? So it's an inverse and it's an inverse simply because if you look at these equations, R is just behaving like 1 by C. Right? So let's do the final part now. Let's prove that for parallel connections, indeed C is equal to C1 plus C2 plus C3. So this is a standard parallel connection. in which we have three capacitors, let's say C1, C2 and C3, it absorbs the charge Q. This potential is zero, this potential is V. That means all these three have a potential zero, all these three have a potential V. Remember in series connections, the potential adds up and the other thing is the same, charge or the current. In parallel connections, the potential is the same and what adds up is the charge or the current, in this case, the charge. So let's say this has a charge of this uh, gives a charge of Q and this absorbs a charge of Q. So these three plates combined should have a charge of plus Q and the right three plates combined should have a charge of minus Q. Right. So let's take this to be Q1, Q2, Q3, minus Q1, minus Q2, minus Q3. The one thing we know is that Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 is equal to Q. Right. Now let's write the equations for all three of them. What is Q1? That is CV. C into V minus C1V, sorry, C1 into V minus 0, that is C1V. So C1V plus Q2 is C2V plus Q3 is C3V. And what is Q? It is C equivalent into V because C equivalent is defined as Q by V. Right? From that, the result I get is C equivalent is equal to C1 plus C2 plus C3. So we've done both the results for capacitors and resistors for series and parallel. Now one final thing I'd like to do is I'd like to solve a standard generic problem which cannot be solved by reducing it into series and parallels. There are many problems you can reduce by converting it into series and parallels and solve easily but there are other problems in which you have to use the brute force method. So I'm going to take one slightly lengthy problem and I'm going to show you the standard brute force method and this is the method which you have to apply in all of our questions involving capacitors and circuits and a variation of this method will be what you will have to apply in all questions involving resistors in a circuit. So let's look at that now. Okay, so this is the standard problem we'll be taking. I have five capacitors. This are the capacitance of C1. This are the capacitance of C2. C2. C1 and C3. I have to find the equivalent capacitance of this system, right? Between these two ends, the ends will always be given. To find the equivalent capacitance between these two points is basically asking me that if I attach these two points to a battery, 
which has a total potential of V and a charge Q flows out of this end of the battery and a charge Q flows into this end of the battery then what is Q by V? That is C equivalent. Right, so that's all that we need to find out. If we attach a battery, then what is the charge? If the battery uh, has a potential difference which is double the original one, then the charge will be double, but the ratio will remain the same. And C will obviously be some function of these capacitances. So we need to find out the equivalent capacitance. Now, there are only three things we are going to use in this. The first is C is equal to Q by V. The second is KCL. And the third is KVL. Uh, Kirchhoff's current and voltage law. Now we're not exactly going to be using KCL, where what uh, we're going to be using what I like to call KQL, that is Kirchhoff's charge law, because if the charge is conserved, then the current is conserved as well, right? So those two things are pretty much similar. For example, it if you use KCL, that is Kirchhoff's current law, then you would say I1, I2, I3 you would say I1 is equal to I2 plus I3, right? But in this case, we don't need that. In this case, what we can say is if this plate has a charge of minus Q1, this plate has a charge of Q2, and this plate has a charge of Q3, then the sum of these three charges will be zero because this can be seen as an isolated system. It is like an island which does not have anything to go through it. Charges cannot flow from this plate to this plate. They cannot fly, right? Charges are going through the wires so that some of the charges on these three plates has to be zero because it was zero initially. Let me redraw the figure because it needs to be clear. Now, I there are generally two methods, two separate methods which I use to solve this type of problem and I'm going to show you both the methods but I'm going to show you uh, the one which I prefer first and tell you why I prefer that method. So both the methods can be used and both the methods roughly require the same amount of labor and both the methods use exactly what we've studied up till now KVL, KCL and C uh, is equal to Q by V. What we'll be using is C is equal to Q by V, KCL, I'm just going to call it KCL for now, and KVL. Right. Now, there are two ways of solving this. One is you use KVL to assume the variables and then you use KCL to solve the problem. The other method is you use KCL to assume the variables and use KVL to solve the problems. Right. The equations will be formed using C is equal to Q by V. And I'll use both the methods, but before that, one thing I'll make very clear. If you have three unknowns, and you manage to find out three independent equations, then from the physics point of view, your problem is complete. All that is left is a little bit of mathematics to calculate the values of the unknowns from the equations. So for the next uh, rest of the videos in the 12th class, I'm going to be assuming that as soon as you have as many equations as unknowns, you can solve the problem. I'll just write the answer and you can check it for yourself. That's the same thing we'll do here. Right now, we don't have any unknowns because we know C1 and C2 and C3. Now, the two approaches are as follows. You can use KCL to assume the value unknowns and KVL to solve the problem. I'll do that first, right? So in that case, I'll assume charges and then use the formulas. So I'll just assume if this is Q, I'll just assume that this plate has a charge of Q1, this plate has a charge of Q2, this plate has a charge of uh, minus Q3, it'll be negative, I know that. This has minus Q4, this plate, so this has Q4, this has Q3, this has minus Q1, this is minus Q2. All I've done is assume five different charges on five different plates and then the equal and opposite charge on the other plate. In this, I haven't assumed. I'm not sure which of these two will be at a higher potential. I can just assume one of the two and if the answer is the opposite, it will give me a negative sign. So let's assume this is Q5 and this is minus Q5. Right? So right now we have five unknowns. So we need five equations. Right? 
three equations we can get directly from using KCL. That is using KCL, uh, sorry, two equations. That is using KCL immediately in order to get uh, the values of uh, Q, some relations between Q. So the first equation will be that the sum of the charges on these three plates will be zero because this is an isolated system. So Q4 plus Q5 minus Q1 is equal to zero. Similarly, the charges on these three plates will be zero, the sum of the charges on these three plates. So that will give me minus Q5 minus Q2 plus Q3 equal to zero. And obviously one relation can be if Q is going here and it is being divided into these two, then Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2. Q is not an unknown, remember that. Once we are able to find out Q, that will be in terms of V. And you can be rest assured that Q will come out to be some function of C times V and you can take the ratio to find the C equivalent. Right? So we need two more equations and those two equations we'll do using KVL. Right? Now we can have, we have three possible loops for using KVL. This is the first loop, this is the second loop and this whole big one is the third loop. Right? So let's say we are writing KVL for the first loop. In that case, the equation I get, let's say I start from this point. So going from this point to this point, no change. Going from this point to this point, we'll have a drop in potential difference. And the drop in potential difference will be equal to minus Q1 by C1. Because the potential difference across this capacitor will be Q1 by C1. Then let's say we move down. Again, we could actually take this whole loop as well. There are a lot of loops we can take. So I'm just choosing at random the minimum number of loops required so that we can solve the problem. If we go down, the potential difference drops again. So minus Q5 by C3. Now if we go here, the potential difference rises because we're going from the negative plate to the positive plate. Plus Q2 by C2. This has to be equal to zero. Right? Similarly, we can write the loop for this or we can write the loop for big one. If I write it for the big one, starting from let's say this point, then we have a potential rise of V. So the first potential rise is V. Then we go here, it's still V. Then let's say we go through the upper arm. So then it will be minus Q1 by C1. And then it will be an again drop at this point. Minus Q4 by C2 is equal to 0. Anyway, so you get the point. You first assumed a certain number of unknowns. You use KCL. To, uh, re to reduce the number of unknowns by finding relations, then you use KVL and C is equal to Q by V to get some more unknowns and solve it. Personally, I like the other method in which you assume using KVL and solve using KCL and there's a very simple reason for that is that because when you use C is equal to Q by V, the other option is here we are actually using V is equal to Q by C or we can use Q is equal to CV. We can write V in terms of Q or we can write Q in terms of V. Here we are again and again using V is equal to Q by C, V is equal to Q by C, V is equal to Q by C, V is equal to Q by C. And I like the other method because in that method you use this and in that case you don't have to bother with fractions. And whenever you don't have fractions the chances of making errors significantly reduces. So I'll do this using the method I prefer which I feel to be the uh, generally shorter method. C1, C2, C1, C2. Sorry, this is C2, this is C1. This is C3. I attach it to potential difference. Now, what did we do in the last case? We assumed charges. Our unknowns were the charges. Right? And then we used KVL to get relationships between them. Now, our unknowns will be the potential. That's what I always like to do. And I always like to start with one of the potentials to be zero. That is another advantage you can use when you're calculating, you're assuming potentials as opposed to charges because you can assume one of them to be zero and you have one less unknown. So I'll assume that this has a potential of zero and this end has a potential of V. That means this end has a potential of V, this end has a potential of zero, right? What are the two unknowns? V1 and V2, the potential at these two points. Right now, all I need to do is I've basically already used KVL in saying that going through this loop, the net potential difference has to be zero. So all I need to use is KCL to conserve charge. What I know is that this plate, these three plates will have a sum of zero charge between them. 
right now one thing you need to do before this and this is very important in this particular method assume a range of potentials that is i'll just assume v is greater than v1 is greater than v2 is greater than 0 it doesn't need to be this way but you need to figure out a way to create signs so if you assume v is greater than v1 then it is you're assuming this plate is positive and this plate is negative positive negative positive negative positive negative now between v1 and v2 you can assume any one of the two we don't know if you assume that v1 is greater than v2 that means this is the positive plate and this is the negative plate right now we'll write the charges so this plate has a charge of minus c1 times the potential difference between this the potential difference is v minus v1 what is the charge on this plate that is positive c2 times v1 minus 0 so basically v1 what is the charge on this plate if we assume v2 greater than v1 it would be negative but right now it's positive plus c3 times what is the potential difference between these two v1 minus v2 and what is this equal to zero because the total charge is zero similarly i'll do it for this case as well and in this case we this is the negative plate so minus c2 times v minus v2 this is the negative plate so minus c3 times v1 minus v2 and this is the positive plate plus c1 times v2 minus 0 or basically v2 is equal to 0 this is the second equation now notice how much easier this method was compared to the original one because in this method i didn't explicitly have to use uh, kcl or kvl to reduce the relations view i already had two unknowns in the previous method i started with five unknowns in this method i started with two unknowns it would have been three except i already chose one of these to be zero that eliminated one more unknown so two unknowns i needed two vario two equations the second advantage there were no fractions because i used q is equal to cv right if you use q is equal to cv v is your unknowns you try to write everything in terms of v you'll not have any fractions if you use v is equal to q by c and you try to write everything in terms of q all the potentials in terms of q you'll have fractions you solve this easily you're ultimately able to get the final answer right so this is the standard generic way which you can solve any problem uh, in circuits in capacitors if that problem cannot be solved using series and parallel series and parallel combinations if you can solve using that always do that that is much easier in the next lecture we'll move on to some advanced concepts in capacitors and finally see why a capacitor is used to store energy thank you